Just keep Should he get ready? Oh, sure again. Oh, can I have one? Definitely not. Why not? I beg you. So, earlier this year, the studio Mimimi Games announced that they'd be shutting down. I'm taking it pretty well. Over the last decade or so, they've been putting out a handful of real-time stealth tactics games, a niche genre they pretty much brought back for a modern audience single-handedly. We'd eventually get other developers carrying the torch, of course, but Mamimi lit the fire. It kinda seemed like a bit of a pivot for the company at the time, too. Their previous works were a pretty okay 3D platformer and a mobile game where you maneuver a hot air balloon by painting wind currents with your finger. They called that game Da Vinci, like the painter. Th th that's a terrible pun, but a hell of a power play. But back before the studio was even founded, one of the co-founders, Dominic Abe, would float the idea of making a game like Commandos, one of their favorite series, but with ninjas. Fast forward nearly a decade and they'd make it a reality. Abe believed Commando's gameplay loop aged like fine wine and would still be great today as long as they brought it up to date in terms of usability. The controls, the interface, and all that jazz. Personally, I think they knocked it out of the park, but that's getting a little ahead of myself. Before diving in deep, what is this game even about? Shadow Tactics Blades of the Shogun is a real-time tactics game set in the Edo era of Japan. The game opens on a fortress assault and the rise of a new shogun. The shogun ushers in an age of peace. Rumors start spreading that a man calling themselves Kage-sama is gathering power and plotting to overthrow the shogun, and you play as a ragtag team led by the samurai Oshiro Mugen, who are tasked with rooting out Kage-sama and protecting the shogun's peace. To actually do that, you'll go through about 13 missions. You're dropped into a map, are given a task and a few units to accomplish it with, and then just kind of left to figure it out on your own. It plays out as a sandbox. You'll usually get some objective or another, but how you use your tools and what path you take are all up to you. Sneak your way through with as much or little conflict and complexity as you want. The world is your oyster. When designing Shadow Tactics, one of the team's goals was to carry on the early Commando game's focus on having a small number of units with distinct tool sets. So, who are the units we'll be working with? First up is the Ninja Hayato, our tutorial boy, and our baseline. Most of the units can take out a guard one-on-one, -on -one, either killing them with a blade or knocking them unconscious with their hands. Which one you go with is up to you, just remember that knocked out enemies will eventually wake up and make themselves a problem again. He has a shuriken that can take out a guard at range, but its range is balanced by making noise and needing to be picked up before you can use it again. He can also throw a rock to make a distraction, enemies turning to face the noise for a couple seconds. It also has other uses. Yoji Kakore. Next, you've got the Samurai Mugen. He's big, bulky, able to take on guards one-on-one -on -one or take out up to three with an AoE. He's also got a bottle of sake. Throw it in a guard's line of sight and they'll come investigate, try to pick it up, usually regret it. Yuki is a young thief who excels at separating enemies from groups. Her main tools are a trap you can place on the ground, and a bird call that will lure any guards who hear it to her position. It's effective. It's really effective. What? Maybe a bit too effective. Don't let Yuki's childish demeanor fool you. She's a stone-cold killer. I probably used her too much, but hey, that's more a case of me optimizing the fun out than an actual balance problem, you know? Aiko is another ninja, the resident femme fatale, and Mugen's partner. She doesn't have any bespoke offensive options that are exclusive to her, but she is great at supporting your other units. 
Her sneeze powder briefly lowers the guard's sight lines. After she finds a disguise, she can walk through most enemy sight lines, talk to guards to pin them down, and clear the way for someone else to move ahead. Or just stab someone from the front, too. That, you know, it works at times. Last, you have Takuma, Team Alchemist and Sharpshooter. They're old, so melee fighting isn't an option, but when you have a rifle that can shoot any unit you have line of sight to halfway across the map, that's not much of a concern. He's got a dual-purpose bomb, either quiet knockout gas or extremely loud explosives, take your pick, and a tanuki named Kuma that can pull groups of enemies toward it. Thank Yuki's bird call, but instead of the guards searching around for the noise, they find Kuma. And Kuma's cute. The guards like that. In theory, Takuma's extremely deadly, but all of his munitions only have a few uses before they need to be restocked at points on the map. He's also slow and loud when running, less all-purpose murder machine, more situational. Oh, his rifle barrel is his cane, and the stock is his prosthetic leg. That, that, that's not gameplay relevant, but it is a cool design. A few missions in, Takuma also makes everyone a shifty little handgun. It's given to you as a last-ditch option if you get in a fight, but outside of the one mission it's for, fights are a bad idea. Well, even so, the pistols have their place as long as you keep in mind that they're allowed and can draw attention if you're not keeping an eye on enemy positioning. Reloading. The differences don't stop at tools. Mobility varies in a few important ways too. Hayato, Aiko, and Yuki are all quick and agile. They can climb vines and use grappling hooks to get up to rooftop shenanigans. Mugen, with his bulk, and Takuma, with his... old... can't. You'll need to be careful when hiding bodies, too. If Hayato is carrying a body, he can only do so while standing and walking. Easily spotted. Yuki and Aiko are weaker and drag bodies along the ground. They're much slower, but crouched and can avoid detection at the right distances. Mugen is built like a bull, so he can carry two bodies at once, and is the only one who can run by doing so. It's loud, but it's fast. Takuma can't carry at all, so you'll have to either pick your targets carefully, or you may just want someone else on cleanup duty. Between the varied kits and other considerations, the devs can get a lot of mileage by just mixing up who you have on hand for any given mission. Everyone works well with everyone else, and figuring out how best to use who you have available is a lot of fun. Yuki, Mugen, and Takuma can all lure guards, but how guards react to each distraction will need different approaches. If you want to rely on Takuma, how do you get him into a good sniping spot, and who do you use your limited shots on? You get the idea. So far, so commando. Nothing in your party's kit is wildly outside what you'd see in the old games of the genre, but it's a gameplay loop that is still stellar. The levels feel like one big intricate puzzle, and with your units working in tandem, you can pull off some slick, satisfying little moves. It just takes planning and execution, and facilitating that planning and execution is where the developers really went to work. The Me 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 team's other big development goal was to modernize the game from a usability perspective, and they had three main focuses, information clarity, player feedback, and just a few general control tweaks. My favorite of their design ideas went into making it clear to players how the guard's vision worked. If you've played stealth games before, you may have had situations where you had to kind of intuit how detection worked, how far can guards see, how much booger room do I have before they notice me, stuff like that. It can be fine, but in this case, they wanted to give players more information. And they wanted to improve on the vision cones that you would find in genre staples. So, if you right-click on a guard, you will see the best vision cone in the business, baby. Enemy vision is built to break down into three main categories. Full green is where the guard can see, without caveats. Like, if you're in it, they raise the alarm. The hatched part is low vision. If you're doing anything noticeable, like standing out in the open, running, stabbing a man, you'll be seen. If you're crouching and crawling, you're safe. Objects in the environment, like Mugen Sake or a guard's body, are also not visible here. Lastly, anywhere that the guard's vision is blocked by cover is clear. No guesswork as to whether something on the map will block vision or not. You can see it in the cone. 
When you're spotted, the cone starts to fill with yellow. If the yellow reaches your character, the guard raises the alarm. All you need to know is right in the cone. Simple and clean. The vision cone is wonderful, but for the sake of readability, they only let you see one guard at a time. To make sure you can tell whether someone else will see you, you can also hold the left mouse button to drop a pin. If a guard looks at the pin, it'll draw a line. Not as useful as the cone, but good for a spot check. Sound is similarly visualized right on the screen. If you make a noise by stepping in a puddle or while carrying a body or whatever, the sound is shown with a circle on the screen. No guessing on the range. Finally, to give players a little extra feedback and make sure they aren't left confused, anytime you're being spotted, two things happen. The game slows down, and it switches to the vision cone of the guard who spotted you. That way, if someone you didn't notice catches you from off-screen or something, the game makes sure to draw attention to them specifically so that you can rethink accordingly. It's all really smart, and makes it easy to plan your actions. That just leaves control. If you're new to stealth games, are bad at micro with hotkeys, or are playing the console version with a controller, coordinating multiple units at a time could be a re real pain in the ass. The team's solution was something called Shadow Mode. Basically, press Shift and you can queue up to one action per unit. Press Enter and they'll do the action at the same time. One action may not seem like much, but with enough planning and timing those actions with others that you didn't queue up, it gets the job done extremely well. I'm someone who frankly sucks at micro in RTS games, and kind of just sucks at RTS games in general, but I never felt like I was unable to pull off moves quickly enough. You can also use hotkeys to kind of stagger out the actions if you need a little more finesse in the timing. Um, I never did that personally, but I also didn't get too ambitious with my strategies, so your mileage may vary. It's not something old-school Commandos players will find necessary at all, but for bringing the game to a new audience, it's pretty great. Everything about the UI makes plotting your moves and executing them pretty effortless, as long as those plans were good. If not, things go poorly quickly. And that brings us to the elephant in the room. The entire video, you've probably noticed a little clock popping up in some clips. That's the autosave reminder. Shadow Tactics is a game that expects you to save scum. Go long enough without dropping a quick save, and the game starts gently nudging you to do so, unless you turn that timer off. There's a trend, especially in modern stealth games, towards letting you kind of recover from mistakes. If you're spotted in, say, Dishonored, you can blink away or fight back. In Hitman, being spotted may be less of a failure state and more of an invitation to kind of slapstick your way to success. The design ethos there is that how the player deals with consequences of failed stealth can be just as entertaining, so if you give them a way out, they avoid frustration while potentially getting some silly emergent story that'll stick with them. There's nothing wrong with that kind of design. Frankly, I love that style of stealth game, but Shadow Tactics is not a game that wants you to do that. You kind of can. Getting spotted doesn't instantly fail you. You can avoid guards or you can fight, but between your units, Sans Mugen being fragile, and guards outnumbering you, a mistake can turn fatal pretty quickly. Frequent quick saves to load from is the intended way to go here. If that's not your style, I totally get it. It took me some adjustment. But it's just the kind of game the devs wanted to make. To paraphrase them a bit, a little bit of pain makes success more triumphant. Besides, the quick loads are fast, usually under two seconds on my pretty modest PC, so just keep it in mind going into the game. Get in the habit, and it is what it is. And what it is, is pretty fun in the long run. Besides, uh, having quick saves is helpful in case something funky happens? Just gonna set this here and, uh, uh, you, 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 oh, okay. Oh. The trick Shadow Tactics uses to keep things fun in the long run is variety. Not variety in enemies, though. There's essentially only four kinds of enemies to care about. Regular guards, guards with hats who never leave their post, civilians who don't attack you but will alert the nearest guards, and Samurai, who can only be killed one-on-one -on -one by Mugen. Otherwise, you'll need a unit to shoot them and another to stab them while they're stunned. 
No, the real variety comes from the missions themselves. Part of it is the actual mission objectives, whether it's hitting a target, stealing something, listening in on plans, you're pretty much always going to be given something to do that is different from the previous mission. They're not recycling things one after the other. They also frequently have some kind of obstacle or catch to change things up. One mission will have a river you can use to traverse on scene. The next has snow and you'll leave footprints that guards can follow. Be careful or use it to your advantage. A night map makes light sources factor into guards' vision. One map may have rice paddies and rain puddles making your movement loud, and another may just remove an ability or something that you've depended on. It's constantly switching things up on you, and that's in addition to limiting who you take with you on each mission. Even better, a lot of what you're handed isn't even necessary to use if you don't want to. If a mission starts with a character suggesting one solution or another, you can usually finagle a way to complete the mission without it. It might be a bit of a pain in the ass, but you absolutely can do it. Once you finish a mission the first time, the devs give you a bunch of optional challenges too to spice things up. I feel it's also worth noting how much the game changes visually too. Even the color palette changes from mission to mission. Start a new mission and BOOM! Vibrant autumnal orange. The game doesn't look like much in the like tiny detail fidelity department, but the art direction is strong. They took influence from Japanese ink works, and it looks delightful when it wants to. I really, really loved my time with Shadow Tactics. Before playing this game, I had basically zero familiarity with real-time tactics games as a thing, but I left a fan and really wanted to shout from the rooftop about the game. Dominic Abe initially pitched Shadow Tactics thinking that they'd make a solid game by sticking with a tried-and-true gameplay loop and tidying up the interface. I can safely say that not only did they succeed at that, they knocked it out of the goddamn park. Shadow Tactics was such a fun time, and it's dripping with intelligent and fun design. There's some weirdness here or there, pathfinding on particularly vertical maps can be a touch fussy, and the story is, you know, it's good, but nothing especially original. But the whole thing is just an excellent first try, and the tech is a good base to build on top of. Mimimi Me 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 Games went on to make a few more games in this style. They got to try their hand at a genre favorite series with Desperados 3, did a standalone expansion for Blades of the Shogun, and dropped their final game, Shadow Gambit the Cursed Crew, in 2023. They're a team of exceptional talent who've been iterating in a weird niche genre, getting critical acclaim, but not necessarily getting the traction they deserved. And ultimately, they're shutting their doors this year. Reportedly not due to financial hardship, but the stresses of game development itself, choosing to stop now for their own health's sake instead of diving into another long, hard development cycle that could last for years. They're making the choice they feel they need to, so I wish them the best. They had a hell of a run, though, and the industry's lesser without them. If real-time tactics games sound interesting to you, Shadow Tactics is a great entry point. Give it a shot, but whether you start with one of their games or elsewhere, Pour one out for me, me, me. The studio trying their damned hardest to bring the games to fans new and old. All right, post credit thing. Um, so if you're interested in the studio's design process, they've spoken with GameDeveloper.com about most of their games. Um, I'll include links below to some articles. Um, including a, a post-mortem on Shadow Tactics Blades of the Shogun that I found helpful in making this video. Um, I'm toying around with some ideas of what I want to work on next, but uh, if there's any games you'd like me to take a look at, feel free to drop, drop a comment in the meantime. I'll... I don't know. I can make a list. Um, I kind of want to play Desperados 3, but... From what, I, from what I'm seeing, Desperados 3 doesn't do a whole lot, like, new, new from what they've done in Shadow Tactics. So I'm not sure if there's enough there for to make a whole new video. Maybe I'll stream it or something. I don't know. This is this is getting long and I think I just heard the tornado sirens going off, so I got to go. Um hopefully this gets <laughs> hopefully this gets edited and released and I don't die. Um anyway, have fun, make things, peace. See you next time.